trail and ultra runners what is going on what's happening welcome to another episode of the coop cast as always i am your humble host coach jason coop and this episode of the podcast is going to be specifically aimed at the second half of the racing season and one particular aspect that i think goes unheralded and how to prepare yourself for the races. And that is, how are you going to manage your emotional energy, your mood, and your attitude throughout the race for yourself? And also, how you can tailor those expectations better for your crew so they can help you out the most. So on the podcast today, I have Paul Burgum, who is a PhD researcher at Durham University. And in September of 2021, he wrote a fascinating piece of research that caught my eye that is entitled Reduced Mood Variability is Associated with Enhanced Performance During Ultra Running. And I don't need to cut through any of the scientific jargon. This just means if you have a more even keeled mood, you're going to perform better. And so I wanted to bring Paul on the podcast to discuss the results of that particular study, and more importantly, how we can apply them to our attitudes and how we approach racing today. Ultra running is extremely difficult. We don't need to make it even more difficult by having these shifts in mood, which are all too common out on the race course today. And y'all know, you've seen it, you've seen runners come into aid stations all frazzled and discombobulated, and make no mistake, that is time out on the race course that simply evaporates. That type of energy is energy nonetheless, just like the physical energy that it takes to climb up and down mountains. So with that as a bit of a backdrop, I'm getting right out of the way. Here is my conversation with Paul Burgum all about how mood variability affects ultramarathon performance. Thanks for coming on the podcast today. I appreciate it. Um, I'm always a, I'm always a little bit remiss when I bring people on the podcast who I've written about their work before, and I haven't actually had like uh, like a conversation with them in in advance. Um, it's because it's always a treat. It's always a treat for me because when I write articles that go out in our newsletter, or even when I produce social media content, I'm very selective about the research that I mention, or the research that I use to frame up a particular argument or, or whatever. Cause as you know, there's a lot of research out there and some of it's great and some of it's garbage. So I don't, I, I try not to grasp at straws as much as I can. So whatever I actually get to get a hold of somebody whose work that I've written about in kind of almost in arrears, so to speak, it's like equal parts uh it's like e equal parts honorable on my part that you'd come on the podcast but also a little bit terrifying because i want to make sure that i've represented your work that i have repurposed in some form or fashion the most accurate way possible yeah well i must say i obviously i read the article um before we sort of touched base and um it was great because it was it was your interpretation of what, what the meaning might be in real terms, you know, in terms of coaching and um, strategy, which is the part that we really want to get to, you know, and yeah. you, you can't always make those claims as clearly, you know, without stretching the bounds of your, your evidence somewhat. So it's, it's nice to have conversations on what things might mean that you can't necessarily yeah. support. I've always described coaching as we, we create logical extensions of the research right? Because we can't treat our athletes like research subjects in almost all cases. In some cases, you can get pretty darn close because they're all individuals. But we, what we try to do is we try to take the research where we take the research and we create best practices around those research. That's what I mean by a logical extension of the research. However, in the in the area of the, this broad umbrella of sports psychology, and how to apply that into an athletic content uh, uh, context. That's where I think we're creating the largest extensions or the longest extensions. Mm -hmm. and, and that's not to say that that's a bad thing. I, I think because you got to do, you got to work with, you know, the cards that you're looking at in front of you, right? And if you've only got one card, you got to kind of like guess at the rest of them. Um, but I, I think it just goes to say, to show how how complex some of these uh issues are and i think we'll get into that a little bit in, in in throughout the course of our conversation but before we before we dive into it too much 
just so the listeners can know you a little bit, uh, a little bit better. Can you give a bit quick background on yourself and the type of work uh, uh, that you do and what you, and what you do for a living? Yeah. So um, as of now, I'm just coming into my final year of a, a PhD in the psychology department at uh, Durham University over in the UK. And um, I'm also a member of um, Durham Arctic uh, multidisciplinary re- research group. So I, I'm currently studying um, the resilience of polar expeditioners. So people who are doing really long distance endurance activities and real uh, endurance there. <laughs> looking into this wonderful um, or polarizing construct of resilience, which will be a whole other <laughs> podcast to follow. Um, we go down that road. Um, and I must just, if you don't mind, give a quick shout out to some of my colleagues in Durham Arctic who were having a social get together this evening and a, a great bunch of people over in Durham. And I'm, I'm here at home uh, right now. So some wonderful people. Um, but prior to that, um, I was very lucky to get a scholarship. Um, I was an undergrad when this study was created that we're going to talk about tonight. And um, I met my uh, wonderful supervisor, he's still my second supervisor right now, um, Professor Dan Smith. And he's a very keen runner like myself. Um, as I say, an average run, ultra runner myself. Um, love to run long and sort of see, you know, what are the things that will stop me running? What's the thing that makes me stop? And um, a great fascination with kind of introspection, maybe the simplest tool of a researcher to think, well, what am I thinking? What does this mean? And, and so on and so forth. And, and just tracking back a little bit prior to that, um, quite open and honestly, um, and as I mentioned before we started, Jason, I was a carpenter in a former life and worked in construction. But I'm also very open about some mental health challenges um, with depression and um, alcohol. And running has been my um, freest expression throughout life from being maybe 11 year old. And so I kind of came into um, distance running as just not for competitive reasons. I was a rugby player. Uh, That was my primary sport. But I've always ran since being 11. Um, so I, I'm quite blessed. I've got to study the things that intrigue me massively. Um, and I'm still like a boy in a sweet shop that I get the same idea job is studying these fascinating things and people. Um, and, and just some, in terms of my ultra run experience, I've probably run about 20, 25 ultra marathons. Um, the longest race is 160 mile, um, you know, single, single, um, con- continuous ultra marathons over in the North York Mowers. Um, and one really curious experience, which was completing the Wainwright coast to coast, which is a 200 mile journey across the hills and fells of England barefooted. And that was a ridiculous idea why I decided to wear no shoes on there. That one. <laughs> <laughs> but these were all things about me wanting to, to, to explore my own limits and um, so on and so forth. But Forgive me. You said this was a short intro, and I've probably took a path the show already. <laughs> it's all good. No, I always I love bringing on people who are they're kind of living their passion, and it's important for the listeners to know. Like many of the academics that I bring on the show, they are also authentic endurance athletes, and part of the reason that they get into academia, much like yourself, is they're trying to solve questions or answer questions that they themselves as an athlete have had come up throughout their athletic career, maybe even continue to come up throughout their athletic career. So it's, it's, it's interesting. This, this, this story that you just told that has unfolded a very similar way amongst almost every single academic type that I, that I bring on the podcast. And I, I just think it's fascinating. That's reassuring as well, Jason. Now I must all say in terms of the research um, that, that kind of intrinsic understanding of races to, you know, to be a researcher, a field researcher, asking people to do things in the middle of these races, really interesting if you're not from the field and you go into a race and try and get a response from people under significant duress at times. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> really interesting experience, I'm sure. <laughs> well, okay. Here we'll we'll put a we'll put a point on uh, that aspect with uh, a conversation that I've had with a sports psychologist in the field, and the listeners of the podcast will recognize his name. Uh, one of the sports psychologists that I lean on a lot is a man by the name of Justin Ross, uh, who just happens to be proximate to me in in, in Denver, Colorado. And um, he he's also an endurance athlete. And he and I have this like standing bet that we have yet to resolve where we're going to go out to the Leadville Trail 100 and we're going to sit at the aid station at Atward Bound, which lies at about 75 miles of, of the run. And we're just going to observe people coming in to, to that aid station and figure out who drops, who drops it there and who continues on. And we want to observe them in this fashion, almost like you did with your study, where we're asking them things about their emotions and who they're running with and all these so socio socio psychological types of factors that they're going through. They're in no way or shape or form related to the physiology. And the reason we want to do this is, is we've, we've both had this experience where we've seen people drop out at that aid station, get back to their hotel rooms and immediately regret that decision because they realized that from a physical standpoint, they could have gone on. There was yeah. something else outside of the physicality of the race that prohibited them or convinced them to drop out at that one point. And you very much did that with this piece of research that we're going to, that we're going to talk about here. And so for the listeners, I'll leave a, a link in the show notes. The title is reduced mood variability is associated with enhanced performance during ultra running. And if there ever was a simple title to a research paper that just went right straight to the heart of the matter and also correlated to that story that I just mentioned, it's this one right here. A lot of times you read the titles and you're trying to figure out what they're about. This one is actually very, very simple. So to, to start out with, can you describe to the listeners what you were actually doing in this piece of research and, and, and the type of research that you were doing uh, uh, to, 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 to start to solve this problem. Yeah, so, so it's worth following on from your point there that um, some of my thoughts and the design of this study came from competing in um, different hard members races and um, actually inspired by some very good running friends who I, I won't name, but if they listen to this, they probably know who they are exactly, um, <laughs> who are fantastic runners and should complete lots of races and often don't, um, potentially because of the psychological aspect more than the physiological, the running ability and so on and so forth. And that was something that really intrigued me versus other runners who you know, on any other day, um, shorter duration races, there would be a massive difference between them in terms of ability. And just the, the longer the duration, the more that seems to narrow and the, you know, the psychological aspects becomes more and more important. So that was something that really interested me with, with the, the study. And I'd, um, I'd been lucky to, um, as a, my first study was looking at navigation abilities of experienced and inexperienced uh, trail users mm -hmm. um, to, to look at their ability to navigate. It was based on this famous study with the hippocampus of taxi drivers in the UK. The, the, the ability to do this was a lot stronger in people who regularly were out there doing it. And uh, mm -hmm. so that, that actually showed me that it may be feasible with this great community to ask them to do things that you maybe wouldn't, which the simple thing is asking them to complete survey measures in the middle of a race yeah. rather than just pre and post. And that was the critical thing in the literature of, of looking at that, of this, we've got to measure before a race and after a race. And we can see that things like fatigue increases, um, you know, vigor declines, um, a lot of studies with similar measures to what we'd used here on, on mood scales. Um, but not what goes on in the middle and what might influence people to, to quit, to have a DNF, um, so on and so forth. So that's when I, I realized there was the opportunity to, to try and get these measures. However, I must mention the first race I did this on, and there is a preprint pre that didn't make publication because I, I did this with the 110 mile race twice. And I actually had them complete measures at six, 
six checkpoints throughout the race, um, through a, a 110 mile race, and it was a 40 item measure. And I wince as I say that now. And basically, we only had five finishes in that race because the attrition rate was so high. <laughs> so we learned from That's that. It's another problem with field research, right? Your participants drop out in the middle of it. Oh, absolutely. I, I think I went for something like, you know, 25 starters to five finishes in, oh in my those God. races. <laughs> um, good. But, but, it's sad, but there's a piece of work out there in the public domain on that one as well. Um, and in effect, we want to look at things like, so, so tension has been mentioned in some studies about what's going on. Um, but wondering whether whether this you know whether this was throughout the race or whether it dissipated fairly quickly was it pre-race anxiety, um, the effects of things like tapering on runners and what their mood state might be. These were some of the things we were kind of broadly interested in. But it was a really exploratory study in terms of can we actually get the data within race as well, and then that simple association a correlation of will mood state changes correlate with performance of runners and we were we were also interested in whether certain moods might be important so literature talks about you know anger and depression as being really really negative things to see coming up in a runner's profile um but we didn't we didn't find any significant results within the race for them but what we did have was this pooled measure um, so just so I'm not kind of um, you know, lumping this in together too much, um, the Brums measure, which is a Brunel mood um, survey, is a 20 item measure that measures six um, different categories um, of tension or anxiety, depression, anger, fatigue, confusion, and finally the more positively valenced one of vigour. And what you can do is create a sum score to basically the five negative um, moods get summed together and you take off the score of the positive one and it gives you a mood deviation across the race. And this was kind of the, the finding that the titles associated to that was, as you've said yourself, is quite a simple finding that those who had a bigger fluctuation in the race with mood, more variability, performed worse, and people who were um, lower on that finished the race quicker. And there's so many reasons that we can obviously talk about for why that might be the case. And what I would say really clearly is mood regulation is one piece of a massive jigsaw puzzle, but it's a piece that's worth considering. And I think that's, you know, not making large claims on this paper, but it, it's healthy for it to be taken into account by runners and coach. And, I, and I'm aware that it's something that you do, obviously, yourself. But I wonder, you know, a lot of runners still, it's still like the dark arts somewhat in terms of, you know, psychological support and uh, so on and so forth, Jason. Well, so many, so often runners have a tendency to put an inordinate amount of time around the physical aspects of their race. And it kind of becomes the, and I think a lot of this is just, that's the easy part, right? I mean, not that the training is easy, but it's easy to conceptualize, hey, if I'm doing a hundred kilometer race or a hundred mile race or whatever, I've got to run a lot. I've got to put a lot of physical uh, uh, effort towards that. But really what we end up seeing is, is there's a very small physiological sphere, which everybody sits in once they get to the start line. It's really not that big. It doesn't matter whether you're looking at VO2 max or power at lactate threshold or any sort of, you know, very classic cardiopulmonary or physiological variable. But then when we get to the end of the race, they're separated by double, sometimes two and a half times in terms of the performance. And that, and the reason I mentioned that is that solely cannot be explained by physiology, right? If physiology were the sole explanation for things, they would stay within the, the finish line separation would be the same percentage as their physiological attributes at the start line. And so then we enter all of these other variables in and it's kind of like, well, duh. Yeah. Of course, if you have a better, you know, outlook or less mood variability, of course that makes a difference. But what was really interesting to me in this particular study is 
the way that I, the way that I interpret it was how well defined that point actually, that kind of like point of inflection was, and then how dramatic the difference it was from person to person and how well it tracked with the, the kind of the ultimate outcome. But then when I think about it, it kind of goes back to that in, initial point that I just mentioned is that everybody's fairly homogenous on the grand scheme of things from a physiological scale. And this ends up being the big, the, the big separator. So did my, my, one of my questions for you, did you expect it to be that telling when you were looking at people's mood variability and how well it was actually going to correlate? No, <laughs> no, no, no honest answer. Um, huh. There was a, there was a, I guess there was a, my inklings were, were intuitive from, um, personally speaking, being quite an angry person in the past. And I'll just go on a, <laughs> point, a, a little segue here that, that is relevant. Because So the first time I, um, I came into ultra running, and uh, prior to that, I played some professional level rugby. Um, and I'd done long distance walks of, well, the span of Europe. And and um, and I came into ultra running very much that um, well, if I want to run 160 miles, I'll run 160 miles with a very naive um, viewpoint. And so I, I went from running a marathon to a hundred miler to 160 miler in three races. Got to the 160, um, had IT band trouble at 55 miles. And being a rugby player, so this is maybe an interesting point in terms of specific skills and context uh, where um, there's a lot of um, testosterone, um, anger, aggression, so on and so forth. I thought that I could use these traits to get around a 160-mile race. And I had knee trouble at 55, and I got 120 miles, and I was completely finished. I was finished mentally because yeah. I completely depleted myself. Um, I just expended so much energy, surpassed the physiological. And when I looked at the top runners, the people who I really respect in, in the UK ultra runners, they're in a place of complete stability. So this was anecdotal, but this was, I, I watched the race winners. I've trained with a lot of the good runners. They just are in a place of, you know, I would say peace is a word I would use. They're trying really hard, but they're not fighting themselves constantly for the duration of a race because at the longer distances, it's just simply not sustainable. Mm -hmm. That was the bit that really triggered, you know, the, the, the finding we got that makes you think about it, that it's that efficiency. And as the distances go up, you've got to be efficient in every way you can. I hope that makes sense, by the way, Jason. That was a bit of a segue off there, but uh, here's yeah. he, here's I, I'm totally with you on that. Um, I'm going to give you my cor my coaching corollary to that, and then what I want to do is I want to explain a little bit more in detail the procedures that you are using during this particular piece of research, and then we'll kind of wrap up with okay, what does this all mean? So when I go, I go to a lot of races as a coach, I'm here recording this in my van uh, in advance of the High Lonesome 100, which is actually out in uh, Colorado. And one of the things that I've learned to do over the period of time is, is that I I'm kind of a best utility to the athletes that I'm working with when I can see them just in advance or ju you hopefully just in advance. And then if I can't do that, just after they get into all the aid station chaos. And what I've learned to do is to observe them and compare to compare them to how they were, how they look physically and also just how they look emotionally from aid station to aid station to aid station. And the reason I try to do that in advance of all, all the aid station chaos as, mu as, as much as I can, or the rules will allow me to is because the aid station influences all of these, you know, pieces of, you know, all of these pieces of emotion. And this is probably a, con this is probably something that kind of like confounds the, the study that you were doing as well. But my point with that is, is, is I'm not necessarily looking at what they are, how they are reacting and what they're doing at that one time, at that one point in time, I'm comparing it to how I saw them a few hours ago and saying, is this normal 
or are they artificially trying to inflate themselves or are they artificially down or for whatever? And then I provide counsel based off of that. And then they come into the aid station and then hopefully they've got, you know, their head wrapped around the situation uh, a little bit more. And everybody who, who is not a coach will identify that will identify with how we follow race coverage. So inevitably during the race coverages out there that people are kind of tuned into, there's kind of like two pieces of data that we get out of every little checkpoint. The first one is the time and then how the person looked, right? And everybody makes their own interpretation of like how people look coming in and out of aid stations and they're all pretty horrific. Meaning you, most people without a trained eye observing so-and-so coming into it, they can't predict how they're doing however further down the field because they're not actually in that person's psychology. They're just saying, oh, they look good or they look bad or whatever. But the point, my point with that is, is we still recognize that that is an important part of the performance. We just can't, we just can't, we don't have the right vocabulary or the right skills yet to properly evaluate it. So I'm totally with you on that. I've seen it. I cannot tell you how many hundreds of times with athletes where the performance decouples from the physiology in one way or the other. And that decoupling is in large part due to, to, to their psychology, one component of which, which is what we're going to talk about is their mood variability. It's just such a huge deal. So before we kind of go into it any further, I want the listeners to really appreciate what the subject group was going through when you were studying them. So can you take them a little bit into kind of like through the eyes of one of the participants, what they were yeah. actually going through during the race? Absolutely. So, I mean, just for context and, and knowing this is a, an ultra running community listening. So the, the, the hard mill was 60, um, is a 62 mile race that takes place on the northeast coast of England. Um, I think off the top of my head, it's about two and a half thousand uh, metres of ascent, um, massively undulating um, up and down. Um, takes place in September. Um, for the two years that this race took place, there were very warm days. Um, goes far to say hot days in a UK context there. <laughs> um, and what we did is, so, so firstly, we took a measure with the, the participants a week before the race as well. We took some baseline measures, so relatively speaking, because when I say baseline, actually, that's, that's a misnomer because some of the findings about tension and anger and things we can, right. we can talk about tapering and so on and so forth and what that means pre-race. But we took a, a week before the race and then oh, I'm back. <laughs> um, then what we did is we met the participants just prior to starting the race. Um, and that meant we took a measure with them between an hour and for the later arrivals, about 15 minutes before they actually started racing, which I'm going to talk about kind of confounds again. There's some variability in that, that some of the participants were a little bit close to starting the race on, on that measure. And then we met them, at, again, not the accurate distance, today, but around 20 miles into the race at a, an aid station. And, and again, maybe worth noting, these were aid stations where participants had drop bags. So they were they were more likely to be stopping rather than at a station where you're just in, get your number and through again, which was obviously to minimize the disruption we caused to runners. And at these points, we would meet them with a team of, um, I say a team, my friends and my older brother very kindly um, helped me out here to, to take the data collection. But we'd meet them while they were collecting their drop bags at the, at the first point. And they would complete a, a survey measure where we would verbally state the items to them. And it's a, it's a, a 20 item measure with single words used, um, give a negative sort of vigorous uh, on a scale of zero to four. And we'd go through that list and they would give us a rating and we would note it down. And interestingly, again, because you, you know, you put me on the spot and mentioned compounds and things. The second checkpoint was at a lovely place, by the way, in North Yorkshire called Ravenscar, um, very just outside Whitby, and it was a village hall. So uh, you'll know yourself when we talk about checkpoints and what's going on. There's a lot of variability in checkpoints themselves. Yeah. Yeah. So this is an inside checkpoint, the second one. 
So there's a lot going on within that checkpoint. And that was at 40 miles. We take that just coming to, for the slower runners, getting towards late afternoon uh, for those guys. And then we met them at the end of the race at Filey and further down the coast and took the measure again. So we took the measure four times pre to, to finish in the race during the day. And I think the measure would have took um, two or three minutes in real terms. However, it's worth noting that for some participants to simply complete that measure when they are feeling tired, you know, it, it, it's a big undertaking. Um, yeah. And I, I, I must say, I, I wince. And every time I see anyone who took part in my study with the 110 race, I give them a cuddle because the fact that they were... <laughs> Uh, I still sort of I, I was learning my skills on that one, so, so there was a lot of commitment from the from the runners to to actually complete. But everybody who started completed, um, which I'm quite proud about in the fact that yeah. we obviously did something right to get the data um, with the participants. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm I'm kind of uh, prattling a little bit. There. Is that enough? Is that enough detail in terms of what plays, Jason? I can kind of go on and. Yeah, that's perfect because I wanted the listeners to understand that these people were going through a hundred kilometer race and every 15 to 15 to 30 K ish, they were having to meet with a member of your team and fill out a survey one to four scale, 20 questions based on, based on their mood. So it's a, it's an actual representation of how they were feeling at that one moment in time or how they were interpreting their feelings at that one moment in time. So now let's get to the the results. And I kind of presented this as, is like the title is kind of a duh, but when I like, or like, which that happens a lot in science. So I'm saying that with all due respect to anybody who does, who does that work. A lot of times we're just confirming whatever the hypothesis was, but what struck out to me, and I know that this, I know you mentioned that this is, you didn't um, expect to see as stark of a, uh, as stark of a correlation as, as what was actually there. Take the listeners through from a, just from a pragmatic standpoint, what the results mean. Yes. Yeah, so, so what I'll do is um, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about this in kind of um sequential order if you like and, and look at the things a little bit before the race um so that that data we collected in terms of um tension anger depression and just just noting the fact that levels of anger and depression were higher a week before compared to pre-race right um, there's some sort of anxiety associated with it yeah and so this 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 uh, I'm, I'm quite you know, anger is something when we, we see le- elevated levels of anger, that's 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 something to watch. That's something yeah. to be interested yeah. about. Um, and so this the, this for me is interesting in terms of tapering and our preparation in the lead up to races and, 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 and having awareness of these things that might go on with us. So we've got people who are putting a lot of training in, high volumes, you know, running many days within a week, every week, strength and conditioning sessions, so on and so forth. And then you cut back significantly within the lead up. And this is putting it in layman's terms, your body and mind go, what's going on? Um, And and we get these things. So we've seen this elevated level of anger and depression that um, goes down by pre-race. But I just thought it was interesting to note that having plans for the taper period. Obviously, we've got the plans physiologically about what we're looking to achieve, but thinking about what we might do psychologically in that period might be something worth worth noting with people. And um, so some of the things that I personally think about doing is maintaining the um, some of the time in nature, in the natural environment. And for me, the North York Mill is where I run uh, 20 minutes in the car, taking out the long run or whatever, but actually getting that fix of nature, being outside, the gentle walk, so on and so forth, and just maintain some of the patterns that are, that are similar to what our body might be expecting. Um, so that that's one thing I thought might be worth noting from a kind of uh, coaching perspective, Jason, that wasn't the big takeaway find in the study, but the one thing that I thought, you know, as a runner, I'm going to be more aware of, it, and actually tell your wives, girlfriends, partners, boyfriends, uh, husbands, 
I'm going to get a bit cranky potentially and, and do some research that's telling me it's okay. <laughs> you, have per, you have permission to be a little bit more on edge because of the tape where it's scientifically validated. I'm with you. I'm, I'm totally with you there. Once again, this is what, I, this is what I'm talking about, about logical extensions, extensions of the research. We can see these patterns. They clearly manifest themselves. And what you're talking about is what most people will colloquially, colloquially describe as the taper tantrums. Ooh. Everything that would not irritate somebody while they're training because they have deteriorated faculty because of the training, they're training so hard, now yeah. irritates them 10 times more because they have all of this reserve that's all of a sudden been, been freed up. Everybody has experienced, has experienced that. And like I said, we've got generally, you know, I'd say we have okay vocabulary to try to try to describe it. But now we have, you know, not just now, but this along with other research, we have some scientifically like validated or evidence-based reasons to why this, this actually is, is happening. And, 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 and we've been able to study it and, and actually mm -hmm. observe it in a scientific context. So I completely, I, I like that strategy of spending more time in nature just to satiate that, that component. I also think that just knowing just knowing that this is going to potentially be a part of it, like just preparing an athlete, hey, you're going to go through these taper tantrums and you can describe, you can bring in the science if you want to, depending upon the athlete. But just giving a heads up is a really good shield against those negative emotions that you just mentioned. Absolutely. And, and leading on, I mean, the, the, we talk about tension as well within the um, – the baseline measure, and I said that relatively speaking a week before yep. the race, and and kind of how um, tension was elevated and then then dissipated. Um, but what what I want to kind of come back to just quickly is that there may be some cost with the level of elevation that we might be able to negate and might have a, a, a functional benefit to us as runners. So you know, if we are angry and we've got higher stress levels. Even things like digestive system, you know, mm. the race, we want to reduce that as much as is possible. And and we're talking small gains, aren't we, across like most things with ultra running, that these might be things that are worth a little bit of thinking about of how can I limit the stress response as much as possible mm. to put me in the best shape in the lead up to the race. Um, and that leads into this finding with tension where so tension went up the week before um, tension was elevated. Um, sorry, sorry, up to um, pre-race, tension's higher. And then literally falls really quickly. By the first checkpoint, it's down to minimal levels. Um, so that's that, that, that the pre-race anxiety quite clearly. And I think the nice thing with this finding is um, I work a lot with or speak a lot with people who might be novice ultra runners people who get quite nervous and anxious about these races, especially large races, busy starts, you know, a lot going on at uh, the, the starting point, of having a, an understanding that, listen, this will reduce, we'll get running, it will settle down and you'll feel okay. And anecdotally, it wasn't recorded, but the amount of runners who were so aware of, yeah, yeah I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not feeling tense anymore and I've just had a lovely run down the coast, there's some benefit in that again for strategies on race day for runners about thinking what we might do if you know looking at individual difference factors of personality and things is yeah. if we're more likely to be stressed by that situation, what safeguards can we put in place? So examples I'm going to cite now are things like, well, I might decide to get check in at the earliest possible time versus the latest time. I might beat the rushes, get me number, get sorted, get away, get my space. These are things that might not matter to somebody else. You know, I might go down the day earlier when I don't necessarily need to, but I know that everything's settled and calm. So these, again, are, are kind of functional things that we can think about. How can I reduce this as much as is practical to just put me in the best shape come the start of the race? And then actually take this finding and, and think, okay, this is going to reduce. And I'm going to, I'm going to use positive self-talk to reinforce that and say, yeah, once I get running – it will all be a lot better. And I'll be surrounded by lovely ultra runners in that busy stage where you're all fighting to get through a, a style or a gate or something and you have a chin wag with, you know, a lot of great people. Um, 
Sorry, Jason. Yeah. No, no, this is <laughs> so what I'm, I, I pulled up a uh, figure one from the from the paper uh, and I was reminded when I was looking at this and specifically looking at the tension line. And I'm going to this is a little bit of a failure of audio. I'm going to try to describe this uh, verbally. The, ten, the tension, the tension line that we were just describing has two kind of equal points before the race and then at race start. And then as you just described at the first checkpoint, it kind of it plummets precipitously and then stays relatively at the same level or kind of goes down right after that. And when I saw that, I, I remember this very distinctly. I remember this uh, quote from an old old coach of mine who he was trying to counsel us on how to deal with pre-race tension or pre, pre-race anxiety. He would just look at us and say, listen, kids, once the gun goes off, it's all going to go away. Yeah. And this this line right there, once again, it's you know validation that that is that is in fact the case. Once the going goes off, a lot of that tension goes away. And I think once again, knowing that is a big part of the combative strategy. But you know, but if you know you have high tension or high anxiety going into a race, there are also other things that you can do pre-race to try to alleviate that trying to pre-plan as much as possible. Any of the things that happen at the last minute, checking, going to the bathroom, making sure that those are not com- compounding this tension and, and anxiety issue is extremely important as well. Mm-hmm. I must just mention the other thing was, you know, we did coll- collect some data. Um, we took a measure six weeks before, and for, for various reasons that data wasn't reported in the end of took out but but i mean what's likely to be going on is it obviously that that tension level's gone up mm-hmm. that's gone up more than it's shown there um and i think it's just as you say this idea of awareness and that it's such mm-hmm. a problem to to actually know okay this is this is almost normal this is right. this is normal response rather than something that's out of the ordinary and lots of other runners are the same and uh you know, and finally, what I mentioned on this point, because I'm, I'm quite passionate about mental health awareness and stigma and things, is just I found personally the, the, the ultra running community is a wonderful open community. And if you were to say to people, I am so bloody nervous, right? Da, 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 you'll get rewarded for that because people, totally. you will get looked after and you will meet some amazing people. So totally. you know, don't worry about that one too much. Totally. Uh, don't worry too much about worrying too much. <laughs> <laughs> let, let, let me move on to one area of fascination um, with, with, with me personally, and I think this is with a lot, a lot of athletes. We tend to pigeonhole endurance sports into being an individual endeavor. And I think that that's largely true, particularly like recreationally, 5K marathon, 10, you know, uh, 10K and stuff like that. Yeah, you're going to have your training partners and physical therapists and things like that. But in the ultra running scheme, as as you're very well aware of, it does become a team sport in many in many and most cases. You have crew out there, your family has to support you during the training process and things like that. And I've always been fascinated with the crew athlete interactions at these races of my previous dialogue isn't, you know, any sort of indication of that, of that fascination and almost universally crews tend to adopt a counterbalancing strategy. And I don't know what the origin of this is, but I see it time and time again. And like I said, it's almost universal to where for whatever reason they feel compelled to counterbalance whatever emotion or psychology the runner is going through at the time. The prototypical one that most people are familiar with is the runner comes through really low and they just try to amp them up. They do whatever they can. And I'm, 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 I'm remembering for whatever reason, all these anecdotes are around Leadville. I don't know why, but the medical race director of the Leadville Trail 100 is, is famous for giving this like pre-race rah-rah speech. And one of the components of it is, is if your runner is coming in, bitching and moaning, just lie to them, tell them that they look great. Tell them that they smell good. Tell them that they're the most best looking person out on the course, just lie. (laughs) And I guess my point with that is, is there's this universal counterbalancing strategy that these crews try to adopt to whether they're really low, they're going to try to amp them up. And if they're really high, I've seen this as well. They try to like calm them down. And I've always looked at that and I've genuinely wondered is that the best approach 
to try to get to swing from one end to another. I, I understand the need to get somebody out of the chair and coax them, you know, if they're trying not to, if they're, if they're trying to DNF or being a weenie or whatever, you know, I get that point, but this emotional counterbalance piece, I, I've always kind of looked at it and I've just been really curious, like, is that the right approach? And so I want to know from, from like your perspective, for the runners out there that are preparing for races, they're going to bring on crew or for the people that are going to be crew like me this weekend. What, what do you have to say to that? Uh, so uh, uh, one thing I mentioned about with um, looking at the social support, support, cause this is one of the things I'm touching on with my, my work right now with, with polar expeditioners and um, field researchers out in Antarctica in the Arctic is about the fit the fit between the person and the crew or the situation and there being a fit there. And obviously this, this can vary a lot in terms of what the best fit is for that individual and that situation, that, that it isn't a simplistic sort of binary um, choice between um, fly them to, to high heaven or bring them down. Yeah. It's a bit more nuanced than that, as we probably all will accept. Uh, and, I, and I think... Um, one of the things I, I kind of put the caveat with optimism and, and kind of doing that is realistic optimism. So there's got to be some grounding in reality for me um, as a crew. Um, and I think sometimes that, that you've got to ground them in that reality and then then bring them back and um, rather than just to be unfounded, you know, because I think what the worry if we bring this back to mill fluctuation is, is you get an overly inflated high that wasn't realistic to the situation, and then you get a bigger fall off. And mm -hmm. that's more common as far as I'm concerned. If we bring it back to this finding, you're more likely to have a kind of an incongruency between their perception and the reality of where they're in, you know, in a race. And then they're going to get out that chart point a couple of miles and go, shit. I'm well behind the four. And there's the uh, there's the back the back mark as the cut off marshals right behind me now, you know. And so I think that's the thing I would kind of caveat this is say some realism is always helpful. Um, yeah. But again, I, I just want to note on this one um, in terms of the person who's crewing for you, and you know, so we've got a lot of family. Um, You've also got people who've got other ultra runners crewing for them. And I think there's a massive, um, the relationships are very different. So people who are kind of um, principal um, caregivers in life, you know, yes. your spouse, your partner, that's a completely different relationship to a fellow ultra runner. And I think that's something I would note in terms of, acknowledge that it's a different thing with it. And I've seen a lot of runners where, you know, family, it's so hard to see your loved one struggling that much, isn't it? Because their personal goal might be to not drop out of this race at all costs and put themselves out of work for six weeks and, you know, hospital or whatever. Family members don't necessarily want to see that and, and maybe don't share that goal in that way uh, versus another ultra runner who gets totally where you're coming from you know, is setting similar goals. And you've got that fit then with the, the strategy of the crew to the person is is congruent. Um, sorry, I'm probably making little sense on here. I'm kind of half formed up uh, thoughts on this one. But what, again, what it says is on this, um, is that there's some prior knowledge in terms of what the expectation is from the crew. Um, and, and for that to be defined prior, prior to the race down, because... Once the race starts, and if we bring this back to kind of Samuel Macora's work about shifting goals and, and how the motivation and goals will shift downward, um, if people have got an agreement of what the expectation is and what the levels are prior, then that's consistent on both sides and, and both sides are more likely to accept mm -hmm. the situation. Does that make sense, Jason? That's one that's kind of more uh, prosaic, but let me let me add two points to that. So, one, when when I started going out and supporting athletes at at, at a lot of races, it was kind of a it was a deliberate decision uh, on my on my on my behalf because I realized that 
this context of ultra marathon coaching, I would be a much better coach if I could get out in the field and learn by observing athletes in the field and also it helped them, you know, achieve what they were kind of achieving uh, in races. And I, I was very fortunate that right during that process, I had uh, an absolutely amazing mentor who, who's been on this podcast before. His name is JT Kearney. He was one of the head physiologists at the Olympic Training Center for a very long time. So he'd seen, he's seen athletes in all different kinds of high performance contexts from the, you know, uh, Greco-Roman wrestlers to the endurance athletes, you kind of, you, you name it. And he, he told me, and this has stuck with me to this day, he said, listen, Coop, when you start to do this, you have to, you have to do everything you can not to fall into the trap of being dissociatively enthusiastic. That those were the two, that was the key term that he used, dissociatively enthusiastic, because you're going to want to be enthusiastic and everything is good and the sky is blue and there's a rainbow around the corner and unicorns and leprechauns and you know, whatever else, whatever else you can kind of, kind of come up with at all costs, because in a, in some athletic contexts, you can get away with that. You can get away with that because the duration of the event is short enough and you can provide some sort of stimulus to the athlete that they can, you know, jump higher, run faster or whatever. But in an ultra marathon situation, it's too long. Mm. So you always have to start with re with realistically what's going on. If the athlete's running really great, you can tell, hey, you're running awesome. If they're not running really great, you have to be honest with them as well, because then you can course correct it. Being dissociatively enthusiastic is one of the biggest fallacies or one of the biggest points of error, I think is what he said. Of, of coaches because it's in their nature to do it. We're optimists by nature, but we need to, we need to fight that nature when we're out in the field working, working with athletes. So to your point that you have to start with the realistic perspective and then move towards optimism as my colleague, Justin Ross would, all, would be famous for saying, move yeah. towards optimism or try to course correct into some, or try to course correct into some other sort of psycho emotional state I think is the better play there versus automatically assuming that everything is awesome. And then you just create this false narrative that is not, you know, is therefore not sustainable. Yeah. So that's the first point. The second point with the crew, I've seen this so many times it's become comical where there's this, there's no, there's no matching of the athlete goals with what the crew is supposed to do. And then once again, they're just kind of, they're not professionals, right? So you can't, you can't really blame them for this counterbalancing strategy. The athletes that have the most successful crews are the ones that sit down with them in advance and not only go all over the X's and O's, I want potato chips here and a goo there and water it, you know, that's easy. You know, you can have a high school kid do that. Um, they, they can drive around aid stations and hand off stuff. That's, that's not the complicated part. The most successful ones sit down and say, this is how you, I want you to help me when this happens. This is my goal for the race. I want to be super stable here. I want to do this, that, or the other. And then the crew is the facilitator for that because at the end of the day, they're not mind readers, right? Yeah. And so the, the runners that are really smart take that mind reading component out by going through the non X's and O's of how they think the race is going to play out and how they can actually help them so that when they actually get to those stages, then they actually know what to do. Yeah. Do you know what? I'll just follow on from that point there because it, it's something um, really interesting if we kind of, we, we're looking at sort of um, mental strategies, uh, mental skills, and so on and so forth. So, if, you know, one of the things with sort of high levels of mental fatigue, um, you know, physical fatigue, is the, the effect on memory. And, and actually sometimes... The, the recall or the cue and of the strategy we might need to apply as an individual. Mm. Who remembers if they have an awareness of the strategies we're likely to use in a certain stage of a race or a certain move. You know, I get using whatever that strategy is. You know, I, I'm a big lover of reciting mantras and counting and, and so on and so forth. Are you using this now? Are you, th you know, th yeah, the exactly. Uh, if you have that really detailed relationship where the mental approaches is on the table clearly 
you know, you can really, really, you can get functional use, instrumental support from somebody. Yes. Um, because sometimes you can be too tired to, to, to actually get that strategy that might get you through that moment. And, and having a buddy there who does some of that work for you, brings it out the locker, then you've just got to get running again and apply it. It, it can make a big difference. And that's one I'll often say to people, and I still play as a runner myself, um, I had a, a really great friend of mine, Martin Kerr, last year, uh, the, the Hard Mills 160, and uh, second night of sleep deprivation. Um, you know, I, I speak about we need a high arousal state because when we're going to sleep, we literally <laughs> and try and stay awake uh, and uh, running with another great guy, Mark Simpson. I was like, I might need a little bit of anger or mock anger as we term it, but, but <laughs> something to really just to kickstart so we don't fall asleep. And and it was, you know, it's that honesty of relationship. Yeah, yeah. You know, help me with the toolbox. I know what's in there, but you might have to pull it out for me. And I think that's 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 the level you may be able to go to. And I'm sure there's more esteemed scholars than me a, a lot further down the track on that one. The, the the key term that I think you just had there, Paul, is instrumental support, right? Not just logistical support, not just nutrition support, which all, are, all of those are important, right? But if you're providing instrumental support, that's support across all the systems. And that's ultimately what's going to be the, the most effective. Uh, absolutely. And uh, just really quickly, why I'm throwing all my thoughts and I've got the chance with, with your, your good self here of just, the, you know, things like... Um, nutrition and um you know digestive systems that kind of um stress response you know that that kind of biopsychosocial model of where the, the interaction is so important you know a reduction in a mood or or psychologically might be a little gain that means you can hold down some food you wouldn't otherwise if you're in a, a different state of mind that actually then does give you a physiological difference like that's the bit that you start to put it all together it's not just being a bit happier. It's yeah. I'm not getting the stomach cramps so bad now. You know, <laughs> I might hold some fluids in, and one percent is all the time. Yeah, um, everybody's had the cascading issues effect, right? That's that's the way that I term that is where you you start having multiple failure points kind of all at once, and it becomes a hard thing to unwind because you don't really know how to like like how to approach it. But I think understanding that if you, for example, if you start to have GI issues, you get anxious about those GI issues, which then perpetuate the GI issues even further. Just understanding that that's a normal psychological loop gives you the, I think it gives you the initial part of the capacity, saying that very delicately, the initial part of the capacity such that the next time you have GI issues, you recognize that part of the reason you are is because you're anxious, and then you can kind of learn to accept the position that you're in so that hopefully those GI issues don't perpetuate. Mm. I, so I, I think that a lot of this, and this is one of the great aspects of the, of, of the research that people like you produce, even though it might be you know, on the surface, a big nothing burger. I don't know if that translates into uh, across the pond or not, even though it translates into a big nothing burger. It's like, yeah, of course, if you're moody or you're going to perform worse, but a lot of it, a lot of it gives us the tools to un not, not so much to understand, but just to go, okay, like, yeah, absolutely. This, I should be feeling this way. And so now that I know this knowledge is power, I don't have to suffer as much or I can course, course correct that much better. Absolutely. You can apply some strategy at some level, can't you? That's You have that awareness to then almost like a flow chart of yeah, what does exactly. yes. mean, uh, is this, you know, is this physical support I need? You know, is this some kind of supplement or whatever? Is this psychological? You, you can begin to unpick that. And, and, and actually, if you take some actions during a race, you, you're more likely to remedy something than just fixating on, um, you know, the GI issues. And, and that's one thing that kind of leads into the world of no brick and the attentional issues of this massive focus on, on sensory monitoring of literally just getting mm -hmm. fixed on the GI issue. And from then on, it's this trail down over of just 
gets darker and darker and you're just stuck on that one train of thought. Um, and and that, that was the bit I was going to come on to, Jason, in terms of then how we implement those different types of approaches um, for different situations. And, and, and we have that flexibility that depending on what the issue is, the strategies match to it. It's not one size fits all. We then have got a repertoire like you have for running uphill or downhill or flat or whatever we've got. We've got subtleties in the technique. We apply the same technique to, you know, you could say the mental approach to running uphill or downhill or whatever. You do exactly yeah. the same. It's, it's, a, it's a different skill set that you can work on and develop. Oh, well, and that's why we I was planning on talking about this, and this seems like a stupid, shameless plug for my book, which I don't care about. I'll plug my book all day on my podcast. <laughs> when I went through the mental skills chapter of, of my book, I made sure to have some of those options there for kind of two reasons is one i realize you know you 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 probably realize this but i don't know if the listeners appreciate it just like you don't like and you like certain physical workouts i like to do climbing i like to do high intensity i don't like to do this i don't like to do that it's the same thing with mental skills yeah and compliant compliance just like any other aspect of training or diet, which has been, you know, illuminated quite well in, in, the, in a lot of the research, compliance drives so much of improvement and adaptation. It's the same thing with mental skills. If you find a few mental skills that you just, for whatever reason, you just really take to it, you can leverage those to a greater extent as, to, as opposed to the ones that you don't enjoy. Now, that's not to say you can't be fully well-rounded, but it provides an initial uh, foothold. The other reason that I included kind of several different types of, 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 of mental skills that were periodized in, uh, uh, in, in a fashion is to, is to just your point right there. You have different tools in the toolkit to perform better. You're not just leveraging one single thing, which you would never do, right? What if you just did one, just think about on the, that on the physical side. What if you just did one workout? Nobody does that, right? They've all got a variety of workouts. It's the same thing on this mental skill side of things. If you have a variety of different tools in the toolkit, you've got not only options when you need to solve problems, but you also have like more effective arrows in your quiver for whatever is coming up, whether it's anxiety or a lack of confidence or some other physical issue that you've encountered in the past that you've got to kind of use psychological work to kind of to move through. All of those things are, are interrelated. So your point's really well taken that developing this robust skill set is a, is a, is a, is a huge advantage for especially athletes in ultra marathon where they're always going through trials and tribulations at some point. <laughs> Absolutely. And just to follow on from that quickly, Jason, the, the probably two things here on this is, is you know, the, the, the first one being, you know, any strategy that's not a usual strategy you use, you're highly unlikely to persist with it in, you know, a sleep deprived, incredibly fatigued state. <laughs> you're just not gonna, you're just not gonna use that strategy. Yeah. And so if we're not developing their usage, they, they won't click into place. I mean, we could sort of lead into habits and, and things like that with this, but once we get them drilled, once they're in there they're more likely to come out, you know, they will click into gear. And if, if you can practice in the situation, if you can use that matching and training, the same as saying, whether that's a, a hill session of saying, right, well, this is going to be a certain approach I'm going to take. You know, I, I love counting steps, which comes from navigation where you want to calculate distance. I just love counting steps, but I love the rhythmical nature of that. I find it regulates pace, and I've never wore a watch in my life, but I'm not a fast runner, so I never worry about uh, other than beating the foot off. Uh, I'm not willing to win anything. But, but you, you match the strategy, and you, you think about, when will I use this in a race? And I'm going to train with it in the same situation. So then those, those associations and those neural pathways are more likely to be formed up. And things happen. And, and and that's the wonderful thing of training, isn't it? When the pressure's on, you know, the old Nike said, just do it. Things will just come. Um, and the second one, quickly, Jason, is just to say with, with ultramarathons where we're talking about potentially a full day and night cycle or longer, in a normal day of our life, we will have ebbs and flows. We will have fluctuations. And that's natural. 
And so having an awareness of our natural ebbs and flows throughout the day might be something to think about as well in terms of mood fluctuations of, you know, whether we are, uh, uh, you know, thinking about circadian rhythm, things, where we are in that, whether we're a morning person, afternoon, so on and so forth. There's natural things going on as well. And again, just to have an awareness of helps us think about the strategies we're going to use. How, how can you use that specifically, though? Because a lot of people will, as I mentioned earlier, they're kind of take a counterbalancing approach. Like if I know I'm not, I'm no, if I know I'm not a night person during the night, I'm going to have to bring in extra reinforcements. You know, I'm going to have to bring people who bring the energy. Is it real? Is it, is it as simple as that? Or there's something, there are other considerations that we need to take into account. So I, I would say that, that, you know, that then is that, that's training, that's training to that specific area that you identify as a potential weakness, if that's the word, yeah. then, then you focus some of your training regime to that. So I know, you know, I always shift, I always shift my long runs to, to the night runs in the lead up to long races and just put them as overnighters. And, and I don't have the time to train as much as I'd like, but you know that sleep deprivation is going to be a, a significant issue you put a little bit more focus there than less focus. And I, and I think that's, you know, that's one thing you can you use, use that acknowledgement of I'm not so strong then um, to, to, to put a bit more work and put conversely and, and equally importantly, um, your body gets used to things. So acknowledge the areas when you're naturally in a good place. Yeah. And we'll give you a very specific example here as a, as a, as a mediocre ultra runner. Every Saturday of my life, I head to the hills for my run, whether I'm training for a race, whatever. And I run, and I'm going to come on to music, by the way, which I know you mentioned before. Uh, but, but I run to a radio show. I don't control the playlist. I go with yeah. what I get. And, and I know Saturday afternoon, I am really strong in races. So I'll quite often be feeling really mediocre in the morning going, Saturday afternoon comes, however far I've gone. This is Saturday afternoon now. This is my <laughs> this is your wheelhouse, man. <laughs> when my body's used to feeling good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's a bit of positive self-talk. It's a bit of this. But it's also about the body is used to these certain times. And, and I think what you have to do is, I'm going to pull out one of my favorite mantras, clouds in the sky. When the sun shines, you have to you have to take it for all it's worth yeah. and you have to really enjoy it without getting overly carried away by it, like party checkpoint. Don't fall into the party checkpoint too much, but you can acknowledge it and you can feel a bit good. Hold on to it. And then when it goes, you know, it'll, it'll come again. And that's that's what ultramarathons are like most of the time. It's these gen genuine fluctuations that we've just got to weather and accept. I think I think you're on to something where if you realize you're really strong or really familiar with one aspect, whether it's a time of day or a type of terrain or even a type of weather pattern, and you know that you're going to encounter that at some time, you can absolutely use that as a, a, a lighthouse right to aim the race at to where you know you like i don't care i just get me to here you've hear you've heard runners say that right just get me to here and i'll be okay and that's an acknowledgement of just what you mentioned right they understand what their strengths are what they're comfortable with or familiar with and if they get there it doesn't matter how tired they are how much their stomach hurts you know how delirious they are whatever they'll be okay because of whatever that is their strength their degree of familiarity or whatever so i'm gonna I'm going to uh, take some pointers from that. Absolutely. And in the races that I'm going to support my athletes for, uh, for the rest of the summer, make sure that I'm more keenly aware of some of their strengths so that they can use that as a magnet to get to, so to speak. That's really pertinent. Brilliant. Paul, Brilliant. this was awesome, man. This is awesome. And as, as it is with any conversation, it always takes a few turns that I don't expect. You know, so I, I, I really appreciate your time. Can you tell the listeners a little bit more about um, where they can find more about you and your work? Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm not quite a full recluse these days, but I, I'm only currently on Twitter as a platform um, as at P. Burgum, which is obviously my name. <laughs> um, 
And I, I think that's it in terms of, I've got a website, which I will freely admit hasn't been updated for a while, um, paulbergham.com. Um, it does include um, some blogs from races I've done myself over the years uh, as well, and, and so, so more personal takes on probably some of the things I've mentioned here as well, Jason, there. So there's some there's some interesting things talking about optimism and uh, other things in there as well that might be of interest to people. Um, yeah, and if anyone is interested anymore in the work or anything I've said, please do drop me a line. It's it's always lovely to chat about your your favorite topics. <laughs> well, I pre appreciate you coming on the podcast, but more importantly, Paul, I appreciate what you do because it helps me as a coach. And I know it's a lot of there are a lot of athletes and other coaches out there that I can speak for that whenever we see things like that come up in the space, we are always thankful because it gives a little bit of method to our madness. Yeah, oh, that's fantastic. Before I go, Jason, do you mind as well if I if I just pay a very sincere thanks to uh, John and Shirley Steele, who run the Hard Movers uh, Ultra Series in the northeast of England, and the whole community, because as, as we all know, researcher or an individual, these communities are incredibly precious. And uh, I wouldn't be sat here as a PhD student if it wasn't for all these ultra runners, by the way. So I, I want to acknowledge that in this podcast right now. A lot of wonderful people in the community. Absolutely. It's team sport, just like ultra running. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Thanks for coming on the podcast, Paul. I appreciate it. Pleasure. Thanks for your time, Jason. All right, folks, there you have it. There you go. Much thanks to Paul for coming on the podcast today. As I mentioned during the intro, I do think that this is one area in ultra marathon performance that goes neglected by a lot of athletes. And one of the more important pieces is how to match up your cruise energy with your energy. We talked a little bit about this counterbalancing strategy that a lot of crews tend to deploy. And I think that a better solution is to more subtly match that energy to your runner's energy in order to help them down the trail because we wanna to try to keep things on even of a keel as possible. And when we do need course corrections, they don't need to be so abrupt. But I hope you all learned something from this particular podcast. Like I said, we are in the second half of the racing season. A lot of this is immediately applicable to what you can do on race day. So if you appreciated this podcast, please feel free to share it with your training partners or your crew. If it's going to be applicable and useful for them, absolutely share this podcast with them so that they can help you out in your particular race. Appreciate the heck out of each and every one of you. And as always, we will see you out on the trails. <laughs>